The mythical founding of Rome begins with the fall of Troy, as the Trojan prince Aeneas fled the destruction with a group of survivors. They eventually reached Italy, founding the city of Lavinium, and his son Ascanius, the city of Alba Longa. For generations, son after son ruled as king in Alba Longa, until we get to King Numitor, his daughter Rhea Silvia, and his brother Amulius. Hungry for power, Amulius expelled his brother from the throne and forced his niece to become a vestal virgin priestess so she would bear no sons to contest his rule. But Rhea's suffering would continue as the god Mars forced himself on her against her will, resulting in a pregnancy and birth of the twins Romulus and Remus. Amulius, in fear of potential rivals, ordered the twins thrown into the Tiber River. Fortunately for the twins, the river was in flood and were spared from the stronger currents. As they washed ashore, a wolf heard their cries and came to their aid, sheltering and nourishing them with her own milk. Faustulus, a herdsman, soon came upon them. With compassion, he took them in and raised them as if they were his own children. Romulus and Remus were not only diligent in their duties at home, but also steadfast in the defense of their people. They would chase down and attack bandits, sharing the spoils with their fellow herdsmen. Because of this, a loyal following grew around them. Later, during the festival rite of the Lupercal, the bandits sought their revenge. Enthralled in the celebrations, the villagers were ambushed and Remus was captured. They brought him to Amulius as prisoner on trumped-up charges. Remus served his imprisonment in Numitor's home. While questioning him, he soon grew to realize that Remus and Romulus were his long-lost grandsons. Romulus, with his followers, mounted a rescue, killing Amulius himself. With Numitor restored to the throne of Alba Longa, the twins set out to found their own city at the very spot where they were once left to die. But discord grew between the brothers as they quarreled over which hill to start building on. Romulus and his followers occupied the Palatine Hill, while Remus and his followers occupied the Aventine, hoping for a sign from the gods to settle their dispute. The sign came first as six vultures appeared over Remus, but then double that number appeared above Romulus. Both sides argued over what was more significant, who was answered first versus the greater number of birds. In defiance, Remus leapt over his brother's partially built walls to which Romulus answered with violence, killing his brother. Romulus was now the sole ruler of the city to which he gave his name, Rome. The ambitious Romans wanted to grow quickly so they opened the city to any who would come, runaway slaves, criminals, and the dispossessed. While many men did come, the city lacked for women and would not last beyond a generation. Romulus reached out to the neighboring cities, seeking alliances through marriage rights. But with all of his attempts rebuffed, he turned to force. Romulus organized a series of games and festivities to be held in Rome and invited the neighboring populace. As the city filled with guests, most notably the Sabines, Romulus set his devious plot in motion by giving a prearranged signal to his men. They abducted all the unmarried young women from the crowd and against their will made them their wives. Naturally, these actions led to war. While the Romans defeated the rest of their neighbors easily enough, the Sabines proved to be a greater challenge. And it was only the intervention of the true victims, the Sabine women themselves, that could put a stop to it. They fearlessly entered the battlefield, positioning themselves between the battle lines. Appealing to both sides, they cried out, Only one side can win this fight. As for us, it is better to die than to live, for we must do so either as widows or as orphans. Their impassioned plea was successful. The Romans and Sabines combined into one people, with the Sabine leader, Titus Tadius, ruling jointly as king with Romulus, though he would be murdered in a nearby city years later, and Romulus would again be the sole ruler of Rome. Romulus's reign was long and prosperous, as Rome's power and influence grew. But one rather innocuous day while inspecting the troops, a thunderstorm descended, obscuring the king from his soldiers. The storm quickly abated, but Romulus was gone. Proculus Iulius, a trusted and respected Roman, later confirmed his fate. He claimed that Romulus came down from the heavens and spoke to him, saying, Go, announce to the Romans that the gods in heaven will my Rome to be the capital of the world. Accordingly, let them cultivate the art of war, let them realize, and let them teach their descendants that no human power can withstand Roman supremacy. He ascended once more and vanished, as once founder and now immortal god of Rome. This version of the myth is based on Livy's account, a 1st century BC Roman historian, as translated by T.J. Luce. Livy recounts multiple versions of the founding myth. For brevity's sake, I've condensed and simplified it here. The founding myth is obviously puzzling for a modern audience in terms of ethics, morality, and the supernatural. But it was a bit of a head-scratcher for the Romans as well. 
Livy himself was skeptical about much of the story. As to what parts of the myth, if any, can be supported by archaeology is a matter for another future video.